Good morning and welcome to the 20th Annual Bridge Speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce a recent Metro grad who will be introducing our speaker today, Ms. Fathima Dickerson of Denver, who graduated in this December with a degree in English and was the outgoing president of TRIOTA, that's our Women's Studies Academic Honor Society. Please welcome Fathima. Hi. I'm getting pictures. Can y'all hear me? Okay, okay, cool. I just wanted to give you guys a little biography on Pam Greer before we get started and bringing her out. Can you guys hear me right now? Okay. Okay, I'm sorry I couldn't hear. Okay. <laughs> Pam Greer was born in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Her father worked as a sergeant in the United States Air Force. Because her father was a, oh, sorry. Because of her father's military career, her family moved frequently and eventually settled in Denver, Colorado where she attended East High School. <laughs> While in Denver, she appeared in a number of stage productions and participated in beauty contests to raise money for her college tuition toward Metropolitan State College. <laughs> Greer moved to um, Los Angeles, California in 1967, where she was initially hired as a receptionist at the American International Pictures Company. She was discovered by director Jack Hill who cast her in his women's prison film, Big Baby Dollhouse in 1971, and The Big Bird, Big Bird Cage in 1972, sorry guys. While under contract at AIP, she became a staple in the early 1970s black exploitation movies, playing big, bold, assertive women, beginning with Jack's Hill's Coffee in 1973. Her character was advertised as the trailer's baddest one chick hit squad that ever hit town. <laughs> the film was a box office hit and Greer was noted as the first African American female to headline an action film. Greer subsequently played similar character, characters in AIP films, Foxy Brown in 1974, Friday Foster and Sheba Baby both in 1975. With the demise of black exploitation, Greer appeared in smaller roles for many years. She acquired progressively larger character roles in 1980, including guest appearances on Miami Vice, Martin, Night Court, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and also a recurring role in TV series Crime Story between 1986 and 1988. She also had appeared on Sinbad, Preston's Chronicles, The Cosby Show, the Waynes Brothers, Mad TV, and in 1994, Greer appeared in Snoop Doggy Dogg's video, Doggy Dog World. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the late 1990s, Greer was the cast member of the Showtime series, Lynx. She again appeared in 1997 with the title role in Quentin Tarantino's Jackie Brown, a film <laughs> that partly paid homage to her 70s black exploitation movies. Between 2004 and 2009, Pam appeared in Showtime series The L Word as Kit Porter and occasionally guest stars in TV series Law and Order Special Victims Unit, where she is a recurring character. In 2010, Greer began appearing in a recurring role on the hit fiction Smallville as a villain Amanda, Amanda Waller also known as the White Queen, head agent of Checkmate, a covert operations agency. Also in 2010, she wrote her memoir, Foxy, My Life in Three Acts, with Andrea Kagan, a New York Times bestseller. And with great respect, we would like to humbly welcome back to Auraria Campus, Ms. Pam Greer. Where is she coming? <laughs> okay, but before we start,
Okay, but before she starts, we would like to honor her by inducting her into the Metro State College Women's Studies Academic Honor Society, IOTA, IOTA, IOTA. And they're always accepting people, so, you know, <laughs> if y'all <laughs> meet the criteria, okay. We are excited to present this word, award, I mean, honorary. It's okay. <laughs> and induct her in. She said, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous. <laughs> but, we're presenting you with this plan. It matches your top too. Very <laughs> nice. No, it don't match you, but we can make oh, it. We really can put nice. this on oh, you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, can we have an amen? amen. Yes, thank you for this wonderful invitation. It's an honor, a privilege to be here. I, I was so, matter of fact, I was waiting for y'all to hurry up with this. <laughs> like, wait a minute, every other university is giving me these honors, but where's mine? So through reading The Secret and the universe, the law of attraction, it came. And thank you for, for coming uh, and sharing this wonderful honor with me. You have no idea how important it is for me to be here. And with my memoir that uh, with, I'm an artful reader. It came in at number 20 in the New York Times bestseller list and it won the African American Literary Award for Best Memoir. So, I can spell. Oh, Metro State taught me how to spell. Oh, thank you, thank you. But um, I want to share something with you, something that I've been working on when I was invited. So I, I want to talk about just being here, being the, the, the bridge speaker. The bridge means a lot to me. America, the Statue of Liberty, Justice, the trilogy of our nation's foundation. You ever wonder why democracy rhymes with hypocrisy? Oh. Can I hear an amen? amen? I don't have to tell that all three don't look like me. Today I stand before the future and I am reminded how far we've come as ladies of liberty. Liberty can be a lonely place or it can be like Egypt. We can all be queens of our Niles and stop living in denial. Mm -hmm. Justice sometimes feels like just us. America is referred to as the beautiful, but beauty and the elusive goal of perfection is what keeps a lot of us in personal purgatory. As an actress and author, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I've experienced firsthand how looks can get you in the door and how quickly that same door slams when you're no longer considered cute or sexy. <laughs> Just like the end of a film, your career fades to black. That's why I made it my business to learn everything about show business. Before I did my first film, I taught myself all I could about acting. I was drawn to the Constantine Stanislavski approach in which he says there are no small roles, only small actors. His book, An Actor Prepares, became my Bible, and it did, and I still have it today. 
I was determined to do my best and let the powers that be do the rest. Acting requires commitment, concentration, and assertion, as do most professions. True talent is innate, like a prodigy, for example. But for the rest of us mere mortals, we have learned and work hard in order to succeed our, our chosen career endeavors. We work very hard in learning. God gave me that talent to work hard at becoming talented. I've been in this business for almost four decades. And in the end, it was my brain, and not my bra size, that kept me relevant. I may have burned my bra back in the day. Y'all remember that, men loved it. But today, my back would kill me without one. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There's some te people testifying out here. <laughs> Today, I believe in exacting where I'm supposed to be, and I am humbled and honored to have been chosen as your 20th annual bridge speaker. I'm back where I started, and I've crossed many bridges to get back here today. <laughs> bridges. I know them well, personally and professionally. I've helped build them and burn them. I've been paying toll since the day I was born a Negro. Years later, I was born a color girl and matured into a black woman. Today, I refuse to be hyphenated. I was born an American, and I am an American. My ancestry is that of the Native Americans, slaves, Caucasians, and God knows what else. <laughs> when the ships first came to this new world, they were foreigners, and they brought disease and death and near genocide to the First Nation. I've never heard anyone described as a Caucasian American, okay. even though you're mixed up too. My hue does not define who I am, but is useful when it comes to avoiding serious sunburn. <laughs> I've been called the N word, the L word. Shocked people when they said, you ain't a lesbian? I said, I tried, I tried to act, I swear to God. And then they tell me lesbians don't carry purses, and that's all I carry. So they, I was thrown off the club. They called me the C word, coffee, foxy, Jackie, but you can call me Pam. All right. Pam from Denver, Pam from Colorado. I will admit, I am colorful and sometimes a little crazy. But crazy is good, as we know this. I embrace all of me. Susan Sarandon said, you know, she doesn't trust anyone who hasn't had at least one nervous breakdown. <laughs> Susan is right. I concur. I'm also a creative, ever-changing, and caring creature. I am you. My hope is that you all view yourselves in your own colorful way. From our skin to our hair color and everywhere in between, we are colored. We all have red blood and shed the same tears, feel grief and pain and loss and suffering. We are human. We are women and we may be in the majority, but we've been treated like a minority for centuries. It's 2011, and some men, young and old, still refer to us as chicks. <laughs> well, cock a doodle doo, baby. <laughs> if I want a rooster, I don't have to look any farther than my barn. <laughs> Next time you hear the term used in or around you, just start chirping. Hand that man a hard-boiled hard egg. 
and be on your way. So you think he'll be insulted? Think again. His first thought, she wants me. <laughs> he might even think you're trying to pick his feathers. Well, you tell him to broaden his vocabulary, and if he can sing like a canary, he can call you a chick. Call me a hummingbird, lovebird, mockingbird, and tell me how much you like my flicks, but please don't call me a chick. He'll still think, she wants me. <laughs> Why? Because women have been sending men mixed signals for decades. You don't believe me? Ask them. <laughs> With a man, what you see is what you get. He doesn't wear makeup color his hair? Well, okay, maybe he does. And maybe he wears a girdle now, and a man bra, and whatever. But he does not define himself by how he looks, but by what he does. A man will look in the mirror, and nine times out of 10 will love what he sees. Most importantly, he'll think you do too. It's been my experience, no matter the social, economic, or educational background, most women define themselves by their outer beauty and not their inner beauty. Women and young girls are bombarded with messages of self-improvement, which implies that we are not okay just the way we are. Two years ago, Hillary Clinton had a real shot of becoming our first female president, and all the pundits and so-called journalists seemed to be interested in was dissing what she was wearing, then how she would stop two wars and strengthen our economy. Nasty things were said about her weight, her hair, the jewelry she wore. Hillary Clinton was criticized for not wearing dresses. A female reporter remarked it was because she didn't have the legs for a skirt. Our current first lady is covered in the media like Naomi Campbell, a Princeton Harvard educated first black first lady and all the media can focus on is what she's wearing and the size of her biceps. Correct me if I'm wrong y'all. But I don't recall anyone reporting on what any male candidates or sitting presidents were wearing. The only time their wardrobe makes the news is when they're caught with their pants down. <laughs> well, as women, we truly are suffering from post-pantyhose syndrome. <laughs> yeah, we took them things off, sorry. We're still trying to squeeze our way to success. We're still trying to dress to impress the opposite sex, even if it means wearing Spanx that can lead to self-suffocation. Oh my God. There's some, we have a, you got your zone. Take them all, honey, not here. You can't, you can't pick up a woman's magazine and not find ways to 10-step yourself into just about anything, from losing that last 10 to becoming a 10, to finding a 10, and so on. You may not like what I'm about to say, but most we women, even if they won't admit it, put finding a man as priority number uno. I need a man, I have to have a man, I can't live without a man. We went from wanting to be Wonder Woman to wearing Wonder Bras. <laughs> Strings for underwear. You can't tell me a string up my rear is comfortable. <laughs> Back in 68, we were burning bras. Refuse to shave our legs or trim any other part of our person. But today, you wax yourself until your body becomes a human slip and slide. <laughs> wax everywhere. 
The only women who go braless have built-in flotation devices inserted. <laughs> Back in my day, surgery was preceded by an emergency. We obsessed about our weight and tried to keep the green monster that is jealousy hidden in our quiet place when our best friend tells us she's getting married to one of the richest men in America. And he just might happen to be your ex. <laughs> what are some of the most popular shows on television today? Reality shows. 16 and pregnant. 19 kids and counting. <laughs> Kate plus eight. Age of Love, Ace of Cakes, All-American Girl, America's Next Top Model, American Idol, Are You Hot, Are You Not? Uh. The Bachelor, The Black Bachelorette, The Housewives of Name Your City. <laughs> the Girls Next Door, Bridezilla, Millionaire Matchmaker, Megan Wants a Millionaire, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, What Not to Wear. And who can forget the swan? Anybody seen Snooky? Today, I'm to speak about the bridge between Black History Month and Women's History Month. I just want to mention that there has never been a man or woman of color featured on a reality show, and Flavor Flav does not count, okay? <laughs> I'm talking specifically about The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. There is still a mindset in this society that black folks don't want to get married. They're happy just birthing babies and going on the Mari show to figure out who the daddy was. <laughs> If I were an alien who would turn to American television, they see a sea of white faces with a little color confetti. My industry doesn't often reflect us as a nation. We all love music. In songwriting, a bridge is the only part of the song that doesn't repeat itself. The purpose of the bridge is to build the tension leading up to the climax of the song or to lead a song to its conclusion. The bridge is a pathway that leads the song to a new level with the goal of bringing it smoothly back to the chorus. Ever heard the saying, take it to the bridge, huh? by James Brown. <laughs> My hope today is to take y'all to the bridge of sisterhood and realize the heavy toll we all play when we only see our differences and not our similarities. In my memoir, I write about the time when my father was stationed on an Air Force base in Columbus, Ohio. When I think back why my brother and I didn't end up feeling inferior every day of our lives, I give credit to my loving family. We were very close, and my parents made sure we had good manners and good morals in public. My mom had always had several white friends who were sympathetic to the injustice that she dealt with on a daily basis. While a few white women were still stuck in racial prejudice, most of my mom's friends, the white women who were married to non-commissioned officers, never believed the ridiculous, denigrating myths and lies surrounding the Negroes at the time. After all, their husbands worked together, and they knew them as friends. And it didn't hurt that my mother had the ability to create dress patterns and sew beautiful clothing. She was so talented that the white ladies could show her a dress in Vogue magazine. My mother would duplicate that hook couture down to the very last stitch. She may not have known at the time, but the other wives, she was Greer Saint Laurent. <laughs> Sewing was her bridge. My mom's white friends knew that they were good people. We were really good people. We all watched each other, took care of each other's children and that my mom wanted the same thing. Today I see what a great role model my mom was and still is. I wish she was here today. She didn't believe in prejudice and didn't want us growing up hating or fearing normal white people. Her bridge was made out of a fabric. And let's face it, when it comes to fashion, we ladies share that passion. During this time, my mother decided to become a nurse, not only to assist others, but to help with the family's finances. She believed very strongly back then that women needed to know they could fend for themselves if push came to shove. Push came to shove shortly after my dad retired from the Air Force and we were living in Denver. I was about 13 and walked into my house and I found my parents separating. My father was packing. I looked inside the bedroom and you could see their marriage was over. Was it my fault? About 20 minutes later, my father stumped out of the house. I remember sitting on the bed with my mom and my two-year-old sister, Gina, and all three of us were crying. 
There was very little family therapy back then and no books or TV shows with advice on how to communicate with the opposite sex. Mom and dad had no idea how to mend their wounds enough to get back together or start over or be friends. And so we all chipped in and as best as we could to make ends meet and deal with the sudden blow of losing our hero, my father. That was my first broken bridge. I found a verse in the Jewish Talmud that has been very special to me. Every blade of grass has an angel that bends over it and whispers, grow, grow. In the face of trouble, I remember that verse, which was my mantra all through high school, even when mom and I discovered that making ends meet on our own was next to impossible. All the money I'd saved for college to go to Metro State was gone, disappeared. I would invoke the angels and continue to grow, 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 no matter what obstacles I encountered. In 1968, I enrolled at Metropolitan State College, then a three-year-old independent accredited city college. There I was a pre-med studying psychology and sociology with the dream of becoming an anesthesiologist or a veterinarian. I got several jobs so I could build my college fund, working like ironing, cutting lawns, babysitting, anything I could do or find. I landed a receptionist job at KHO radio station, which was close to campus. I was 18, and people were starting to tell me I was pretty, whatever that meant. I had a little awareness of my own beauty. My hair was healthy and long, and my looks were exotic, since I was multiracial. I was encouraged to compete for the title of Miss K. How? I can't begin to tell you how terrified I was to enter that contest. I was so flustered that I put on my swimsuit backwards. <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to show cleavage. What can I tell you? It was a mistake. But I guess it looked fine that way because I walked away with the title and a check for $100, which went straight to my college fund. This is what women did during this time, and I joined right in. Back then, the wider you looked, the more you were accepted. And unfortunately, that stigma still exists today. I had women friends who were much darker skinned than I was. They had noses that were more ethnic, full, luscious. And a lot of white folks, they pay a lot to get that today. But these features were not considered beautiful in the late 60s. For women, the black power movement was a validation of their inner and outer beauty. It made sisters feel they were a part of a group that saw their dark skin and afros beautiful. They stood side by side with the brothers and they were ready for revolution. It is an urban legend that the Black Panthers were all about violence. They were about self-reliance. They took it upon themselves to police their neighborhoods and run the dope dealers out. There were no gangs. They formed schools to educate and food banks to feed the poor. Black women, myself included, were also very involved in the feminist causes at the same time. But you must remember we were fighting two wars, sexism and racism. It was exhausting exhilarating, and liberating. But here we are today, and most women of color featured in film and television are biracial or light enough to look white. This has manifested itself into black-on-black -black loathing. Most white people will find this hard to understand. But after centuries of being judged by the color of our skin and the texture of our hair, to this day, we are sometimes a race divided. Light skin was in, still is. If looks could kill, I would not be standing here before you today. My dark sisters always had it rougher than her light counterparts going all the way back to slavery. The house nigger was always light and the field nigger was dark as night. This was and is the divide and conquer strategy within our race and one that extends to all races, all creeds, and social degrees. In order to maintain power and influence, it is much easier to prevent small powers from linking forces than to break them apart as they are aligned. Every black woman in this room knows what I'm talking about. As much as things change, they remain the same. I continued at Metropolitan State where a psychology professor, I wish I could find him, took a genuine interest in me. 
He must have seen my passion for learning and asked me what I wanted to do with my life. What am I interested in? What do I want to do, he said, not what other people want from you. First, my thought was he was trying to tell me to change majors or that I might need to seek psychiatric help. <laughs> Suddenly, I blurted out, I'm interested in, 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 as a little girl, I stuttered when I was afraid. I, I'm interested in film and TV, I told him. Deep down, I knew I had to let go of my dream of becoming a doctor. There were just too many racial, gender, financial obstacles before me, bridges that I was unable to cross at the time. Well, he said, go to film school. I heard him say, dream on, sister. <laughs> I kept dreaming and heard that they were holding auditions for the 1970 Miss Colorado Universe pageant. And the prize was several thousand dollars and money I could pay for school and I needed to go and I needed a sponsor because it cost a lot of money. So with my mom's help, we convinced a major supermarket chain to, to bet on me. Next, I had to choose a foreign country to represent. I asked for Miss Africa, it was taken. <laughs> An obvious choice. But someone had claimed that country already, so clearly I couldn't choose Miss Norway or Japan. So I choose Miss India, partly because it suited my looks and partly because no one else had taken it yet. <laughs> the Vietnam War was raging and the Kent State riots were exploding and I was focused on Mahatma Gandhi and Indira Gandhi and what outfit Mama Saint Laurent was gonna come up with. <laughs> I came in first runner up. I didn't win, but there were two Hollywood agents in the audience and. I was apparently what they were looking for. I didn't know it at the time, but I was about to add the cinema rights movement to my list of movements, the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement. I became the first black woman to grace the cover of Ms. Magazine in 1975. <laughs> and to this day, I can call Gloria Steinem my friend and sister in arms. Three of my favorite quotes from her may resonate with some of you. She said, I have yet to hear a man ask for advice on how to become, how to combine marriage and career. <laughs> and we've begun to raise our daughters more like sons. But few have the courage to raise our sons more like our daughters. And lastly, she said, the truth will set you free, but first, it will piss you off. <laughs> yes, I was pissed off. My first movie was a big dollhouse shot in the Philippines about a bunch of women in a prison in South Asia. I played the part of a tough talking bisexual prostitute named Greer. In other words, every man's fantasy. <laughs> what followed was a string of similar roles with similar outfits, but I was looking for college tuition. I was a wet t-shirt queen and all the while trying to maintain my dignity and keep my eyes on the prize of opening doors for other black actresses who up to this point were maids, mammies, and minstrels. Before long, the explosion of black cinema, that included Superfly, Shaft, which by the way made Isaac Hayes the first black composer to win an Oscar for Best Original Score. <laughs> I did Coffee, Foxy Brown, Sheba, The Mac, and, and I didn't do Cleopatra Jones, but it was made, just to name a few, by my dear friend, the late Tamara Dobson, who I give homage to. They were quickly dismissed and came to be known as black exploitation movies. Who ever heard of a black action hero, they said. Suddenly, black folks, and me included, were on the big screen with big guns killing black and white bad guys. There are many theories on how this label came to be. One popular one was that although the cast were primarily black, the producers were white. That may have been the truth, but the same can be said today. What little color you see on the screen is a plenty compared to what color you still find behind the scenes. As I stand here before you today, there is not a single black person who can green light a movie or a television show or a reality show. In other words, the power still remains in the hands of the white man. 
And before you start thinking of famous black filmmakers, Aunt Oprah, even she, unless she puts up her own money, has to get project approval if she seeks studio financing. Well, she don't need it anymore. But back to the term black exploitation and why I think the films were labeled as such. In my opinion, the movies were popular with whites too, very popular. They saw Coffee, Foxy Brown, and Sheba when they were 10, 13 years old. They weren't old enough, but they saw it. And this word, the powers that be. We can't have white women lusting after Superfly. <laughs> What's next? Interracial love scenes? This may play big in the cities, but riots could break out in the middle of America. True story. Julia Roberts and Denzel Washington starred in the Pelican Brief. And in 1993, film based on the best-selling novel of the same name written by John Grisham. In the movie, Julia stars as a young law student and Denzel as a, as a Washington, D.C. reporter who joined forces in this legal thriller. In the book, Denzel is white. Gray Grantham, he's a white lawyer. When Julia and Denzel kissed on screen, the studio assembled test audience to gauge their reaction to this intimate encounter. Would they be okay with a black man kissing a pretty woman? Yeah. No, they were not. <laughs> that scene was removed. Even Julia Roberts, one of the biggest movie stars at the time, was overruled. The scene was out. Remember, it was 1993. I have to go black, I mean back, <laughs> to the 70s cinema and expel the notion that films comprised of mostly black actors only serve to reinforce stereotypes about us. Every character in a movie is a stereotype. Ever heard of the term typecast? Remember The Godfather? Clockwork Orange? Dirty Harry? Jaws? Is it me or did the aforementioned films contain excessive violence and stereotypes? Talk about fish exploitation. They didn't need a bigger boat. They just needed to leave that damn shark, shark alone. <laughs> Who runs after sharks? <laughs> like a bridge over troubled waters is how I understand the historic synergy between black history and women's history. Oppression does not discriminate. It has no color or gender. Its main goal is to destroy by using the strategy of divide and conquer. We can be our own worst enemy. We get jealous, date married men, and are more obsessed with our looks today than at any time I can remember. Back in my day, we fought tooth and manicured nail and demanded our equal rights. We may not have always agreed on what bridge to take or which battle was more important, but we never wavered in our belief that we would all benefit from equality as women, black, white, and every color in between. United we stood, and when we marched, it was arm and arm, sister and sister. The strategy of divide and conquer has been around the, the centuries because it works. It's at work all around the world. I'm not an expert on cultures and civilizations, civilizations but I do know I've witnessed a major shift for a we to me generation. This deadly process has penetrated every sector of our society. And if the next generation lets it continue, we will be a nation of haves and have nots and have littles and have less and have more. We're almost there. I wouldn't want to be a have when the have nots get fed up and unite and even the score. Don't even think another revolution can ha can't happen here. It's happening right now all over this country. In Egypt, the revolt was not just about removing a dictator. It was about the have-nots having reached the end of their ropes. We are no longer a society of we. It's all about me. Over the last 30 years, we've become a nation obsessed with ourselves. While the other countries grew, we shrank. There's no all for one and one for all, just all for me. An army of one only works if you're Rambo. <laughs> Did I mention Egypt? 18 days. In just 18 days, the people came together and said no more. Stood their ground. 
and risked their lives, hundreds which were lost in order to be free from personal and economic oppression. We run 10 Ks for the cure, only if it won't ruin our pedicure. I'm not going to stand here and read you a list of all the great women, black, white, Native American who stood for change and many who died for it. That's why we're here at the Institute for Women's Study and Services. Study the past, put focus on our future. Oppression, discrimination, sexism, ageism, all kinds of isms are here today. Sadly, I see us going backwards. We've gone from Victorian ways to Victoria's Secret. From burning bras to breast implants, some of us would love to be crowned the biggest loser. My generation fought for black power, women's rights, rights, equality and justice for all. It seems most young women don't realize that they wouldn't be where they are today if it were not for the sacrifices of women who came before them. Today, women want weaves, big lips, butts, and breasts. We've come a long way, baby. But I have faith that together we can build a new bridge for the future by becoming us, the people, once again. And I'm including men in this equation. We must, we must first stop the hyphenation of America. If you are born here, naturalized, raise your right hand and pledge allegiance, you are an American. We are the only country in the world that dictates their citizens' race. Asian American? Last time I checked, Asia was a continent. So was Africa and South America. Maybe this needs to stop. A question. Start a drive of petition. Start viewing others as you would view yourself, not caring what their nations of origin is. Does it really matter? If we don't stop this behavior, we will forever be caged in racial and gender stereotypes, which is exactly what the powers that be want us to be. Divide our country, divide and conquer, baby, no. Or unite and fight for your rights, for all of our rights. Now I know why the caged bird sings. Ah oh, me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings. Many of you might think I just quoted Maya Angelou, and you would be incorrect. I know why the caged bird sings is the title of her 1969 autobiography, but the poem I just read is called Sympathy, and it was written by Paul Dunbar, the first widely recognized black poet. His parents were slaves and escaped through the Underground Railroad to Dayton, Ohio. His first book of poetry, Oak and Ivy, was published in 1892. His books, Majors and Minor, got a full page review in Harper's Weekly in 1896. Unfortunately, he grew frustrated by his inability to be revered and as were in his, as his contemporary white writers, and he began to drink heavily. He was very depressed. He didn't understand why. He died at the age of 34. One quote of mine is I remembered every time I meet someone is that when someone shows you who they are, believe them. I don't know whether it's nature or nurture, but we women are always trying to change someone. More specifically, men. You can't change a person. You can't change any person. Change comes from within. When you are treated badly, your only true option is to distance yourself from that person, place, or thing. It's narcissistic to believe that you have the power to mold any person to your liking. I must stress that men are not our enemies. They are our fathers, brothers, friends, boyfriends, husbands, co-workers. I love men too, too much sometimes. <laughs> if you read my book, you know all about all my manifestos. Mm -hmm. I must confess my need for anatomy stopped me many times from the path to matrimony. I'm sorry. And these young men here today? And for all you mothers of sons who think no woman is good enough for your son, 
another mother thought the same thing of you. <laughs> and so the cycle continues, or does it? If this last election taught us anything, we almost elected our first female president. That decision divided many of us. I'm not going to tell you who I voted for, but what I'll tell you is I never thought that I'd see a man of color in the White House, not in my lifetime. I say colored because our president is biracial. We are all witness to this history. I read the Institute for Women's Studies mission statement in part its goal is to offer a rigorous curriculum in women's studies to educate the campus and community about women's lives, histories, encourages engagement in critical dialogue and an advocacy for social justice. Under your women's study description, it states that the program emerged from the grassroots feminist movement, of which I was one, of the 1970s. Your guideline states that women's studies stresses the importance of social constructs and contexts, such as gender, ethnicity, race, class, and sexual identity, to the understanding of individual and collective experience. I hope your program includes a lot of male students. Men don't study women because they don't see how this knowledge is going to give them a heads up in the business world. Women are still preserved as, as means to an end in some cases. A man decides when he's going to get married. You don't. A man decides when he wants to have children and has the luxury of waiting until he's 80, <laughs> if he wants to. <laughs> Maybe some Viagra included. I don't know. But we don't. It's not fair, but it's a fact. Women are fond of referring to God as a she. Well, I have my doubts. If God was a she, <laughs> it would be that men would have to go through childbirth <laughs> and diet most of their lives. <laughs> That's for sure. I've never heard a man say, does this make me look fat? <laughs> In the business world, where few of us are chosen for the choice jobs, we may come to see our sisters as enemies, divide and conquer. We have to hold ourselves up in the same standards that men do and teach our daughters and sons to treat others as they wish to be treated. Yes, the golden rule, which is found in every religious dogma, learning begins at home. And mama knows best during the early stages of child development. They teach them how to treat others. So many mothers today secretly feel that they gave birth to Jesus or, or Bill Gates because they were born to do great things. Yes, they do. And when it comes to their daughters, most though they, they wouldn't admit it, I still hope my daughters are pretty, smart, and marry up. Independence is priceless, which is why I'm going to end with the tale of two women. The first is Maggie Lena Walker, who was considered a financial phenom. She was born in 1867 in Richmond, Virginia, where she was a school teacher for several years. She became involved with a group called the Independent Order of St. Luke. This was a black self-help group in Virginia. She became the group's secretary treasurer in 1899 and assisted the organization in turning its first profit. The institution grew strong enough to establish its own insurance and banking organization. Mrs. Walker became chairman of the board of the Consolidated Bank and Trust Company. Mindful of the needs of the less fortunate women, Mrs. Walker established the Council of Colored Women and served on the board of the National Urban League. By the time she died, 1934, she left a career legacy that many young black women follow today. It's too bad that Mrs. Walker didn't get the opportunity to network with Kate Gleason, who was the first white woman to be president of a national bank in 1917, and the first woman to be a member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in 1918. Gleason became president of the first national bank of Rochester, New York, after the male president resigned to join the military during World War I. She served as president until 1919. During her short tenure, she, promote, she was promoted to the largest developments of low-cost housing. She developed them, having tasted the freedom and power that went with her position. Gleason left the bank in 1920 and bought land in the Sea Islands off South Carolina, where construction was begun on what she planned to develop into an artist and writer's colony. Sadly, the resort was not complete until after her death in 1933. 
Her younger sister oversaw the completion of the building. There are currently 15 female CEOs that run a Fortune 500 company. Of those, one is a black woman. On average, a working professional woman makes 80% less than her male counterpart. And maybe her family mortgaged their home and had to pay 100% to pay for her education, and she still has to receive 80%. Women are starting to outnumber men in the workforce and the population in general. We need to start walking the walk and talking the talk. And not just strive to survive, but to strive and take it to the bridge. <laughs> Thank you. I said get up on the downside. Everybody get up. Huh. Take it to the grid. My dog Snoop Doggy Dog left his autograph on my speech this morning. And Metro State gave me those skills. I love Q&A. This is where it gets like a tabloid-ish. How can, could you repeat that? How can we reverse the 80% of the body reduction Isn't it wrong? And I had a woman said, sleep with all the men. I said, that's a lot. I don't know. But I believe that it's, it's education and knowing how to circumvent those obstacles. The more education we're able to get those loans to start the businesses, then you may not have to worry about breaking through the corporate ceiling when you ha you're the president of your own company and chain of shoes. It's called OWN. Ownership. And I've started with little little girls talking do they have little programs where they're either making potholders or doing something to be their own little corporation and what it's like to be their own little CEO. I've had little girls come out to my neighbor and said, I'll clean the stalls every month and here's my price. And I said, Is it open for negotiation? She said, mm. I said, if I give you lunch and take you home, is it okay? Mm, here's these little girls are already starting because their fathers open that dialogue to them. So more dialogue, more just expansion of you can do it. You can do it. And it would, because I literally, I know many families that mortgage their homes to put their daughters through college and had to pay 100% plus interest. And in workforce, they get paid 70%, 80%. You got to bring that up. Stand up for it. Make them squirm. We are the people. We are the people that put the mortgages, pay for the mortgages that supply the banks to make out loans. We do that. We have control. Okay, lunch. Okay. Stand up. Let everyone see you. My name is Aaron Hall. I just want to say I love you. Uh, by the way, I have a question. Um, for anybody who's aspiring to do anything with their life to be successful at it, be successful at it, what words of encouragement do you have for them? Um, I would rather you know, just have friends and others have a job, yeah. Uh, could you repeat that, please, or is the... For anybody who's aspiring to be anything, what words of encouragement do you have for them? If anyone's aspiring to be... If you're trying to succeed, what words of encouragement do you have? Did you say anything? Anything that you can to be. Well, you can as aspire to be anything and everything forever if you're curious and you want to learn by reading. I go online and I study courses. I studied, I just found out Aristotle was the first philosopher who said and was debated 
that plants had a soul, and that animals had a soul, and that human beings had a soul. I am an Aristotelian. I study him. I could have stopped, but I want to learn so I can share. So I think when there's something that you want to do, you can only do one thing well. Go after it, research it, Google it, damn it. You can Google anything, you can find out anything. Wikipedia, mm, but Google it. Find out what you, find out where the niche is. You know what I'm trying to do? Which is you have an agriculture, I think probably here at the Metro State Agriculture Division like they have at CSU. Our farmers starve during the winter. They don't have to. I worked in Vancouver, BC, British Columbia. It rains 10 months out of a year. Clouds, we have 300 days of sunshine, don't we? Okay, the first frost, we shut down and starve. Farmers can't send their kids to college, repair their trucks. Six months, land is, is, is idle. While I was doing the L word, which gave me great lessons to work in Canada, I saw that there were greenhouses all along the freeway because the ground is saturated with water and rain 10 months out of a year. The highest rate of depression and rain and clouds. They have to have lights and, and, to, on the, and take a lot of vitamin D. They built greenhouses for their farmers. And they grow organic vegetables all year round. Why can't we do that here in Colorado, where your, your food, your produce, organic produce, isn't shipped past 30, 50 miles for three weeks sitting in a warehouse or a truck ripening? Every time I open a box of lettuce, if you don't eat it that minute, it's soup. And you got to turn it over, and while you holding it, it's rotten. Why can't we have all up and down uh, Parker Road, all from, from border to border, Farmers markets where you can go buy fresh produce every two or three days. Organic. And get the farmers, give them some money so they can have some dignity and do what they do best. They don't have to freeze during the winter. That's what I'm trying to do. Can you imagine going to a farmer's market three or four times a week, meeting people, having coffee, looking at the beets and the fresh fruit, and you know that your kids are getting poisoned? We have one more question. Okay. My name is Trina Rodriguez. Um, I was curious about um, your definition of uh, black exploitation and the different terminology that came about that. And I was wondering if you could, if you approve of the name, and if you don't, would you give it a different name? Or how would you define it? Okay, that is a multi-dimensional question. Okay, uh, do we have the tape of, of the, I can turn it back, just kidding. Um, black exploitation is any action and expression of violence in film, which men like. Those are the movies that they love. They got to get that testosterone out. They got to punch and kick and scream and shoot. Um, it was termed black exploitation by a man at, a black man at American International Films, where my films were being made just to identify the type of film, black culture, exploitation, and of course, you know, the media is going to get very fuzzy and be very succinct about it, black exploitation. So as opposed to saying it's a black action film with black culture, black music, you're going to bounce to the outs, you know, you're going to have, you know. So that's what it was for. And my opinion of it um, is some people, you know, we all have different perspectives. Some will say negative, some will say positive. I was in the middle of the conservatives. The conservatives didn't want to see a female step into male shoes with a gun. They didn't know I was from Colorado. <laughs> My mom was from Wyoming. We took our guns and we were feeding our families. We weren't putting a trophy on the wall to say, I killed an animal. We were feeding a huge family. So I, I'm from a family of hunting and shooting and fishing and camping. This is what Colorado does. And when I came to Hollywood with that attitude, they didn't know what to do with me. I walked in, they all backed up. Because I had on a flannel shirt, Timberland boots. And the Timberland boots were $9.95 from Sears. And they looked at me and said, but you're so raw. 
And I said, yes, I am raw. Sundiata, Angela Davis. You know, I was there. I didn't have blue eyeshadow on. I had a big fro, and I was arrested at the LA border when I drove into town with my family's hunting jeep. Is that vehicle legal? Because it doesn't have doors? Or windshield? And there's buckshot holes in the side? You gonna take it from me? <laughs> Just try. I'm from Colorado. We for real. And God saved us. Usually we had them three feet snowstorms. We can handle it. We can get to work. Our businesses don't stop. I like it here. My mom's from Wyoming. The Black West, the Underground Railroad. We're hardy stock. And it keeps my cellulite down. Okay. You get out there. And you or you're on your snowmobile? Yeah, you gotta have a snowmobile. Come on, we don't low ride anymore. We're on snowmobiles. The Black Brotherhood of Skiers, 7,000 members. They drop four meal at Vail every year and leave it clean. And that's where the men are, by the way. And when they have the pajama party, look out. You can go home with a husband. If you want, if you read the right negligee, but we won't go there. So, but and to answer your question, my opinion is that it was it was definitive, it was defining, and I'm and I think it was a positive, very positive, and to this day it transcends all around the world. I was in uh, England signing autographs of Coffee, Foxy Brown, and Sheba in Russian, and so I said, "Where'd you get these in Russian?" Then I saw the man standing with the members-only jacket. He looked like the KGB. I said, never mind, I didn't ask that question. I don't want to know. I don't want to know about black mafia, Russian mafia, Makwa. I, I know the black Russian is a drink. However, I don't want to go. I don't care. But otherwise, I, I feel it's from what perspective are you looking at it from? As you should look at everything as a critical thinker, as opposed to being judgmental. And it kept an industry going and opened up an industry for black Hollywood. And Quentin Tarantino. Well, can I share this with you before they kick me off the stage? Um, Quentin Tarantino reaches out to young filmmakers, and he reached out to one who was studying Quentin. His name was Riza, RZA, and he was in Wu Tang Clan. And he's a fabulous director, and he hired me to play his mother in a film that we shot in Shanghai, China, with Russell Crowe and Lucy Liu called Men with Iron Fist. And that's a part of a comic you know, book legacy. And he's a fantastic director. We collaborated, we did wonderful things. And so, you know, when, you, when people define a rapper or a gangster rapper as someone who doesn't have education or he's a nihilistic, he doesn't care about community or family, that's a prejudgment. Many of them didn't have film schools in their junior high schools. And they're just now catching up with their brilliance and their artistry. And they're, they'll be doing videos. They can afford to make their own movies. It might be a, a budget of a million dollars as opposed to 10 or 20. But they're saying something about what they've learned. And for him, to be sitting there in this dressing room early in the morning, I'm playing his mother in, in 1860. And he had written this script beautifully. Quentin wouldn't finance him or supported him if he was an egghead. He brought something to Quentin and said, I want to be a filmmaker. Quentin said, show me what you got. I'm from 110th Street. And that's what's foraging. And then Riza will teach someone else. So that's what we do. Share our knowledge. Pass it on. Pass it on. Embrace our young brothers who think they're lost and think they need drugs to get through the day. Think they need to jack somebody up to get through the day. They don't need to be jacked up. Here, here's a book. Come, let's go to the bookstore. Let's learn about something. Own your own company. Whether it's roofing or plumbing, you know, there's things. I, and, and people were really judging Risa. They said, oh, he don't know nothing. He's brilliant. And Eli Roth, who produced Inglorious Bastards, is producing him and making sure he does it right. They all have faith in him, so have faith.
I had faith in Metro State and let that teacher tell me I should move to California and I don't know anybody out there. And he says, but you need, you need to be a filmmaker. We don't have that here. Can you imagine? There's the only four film schools in this country when I graduated in 67 and 68. It was UCLA, USA, NYU, and Northwestern. That was it. Fast forward. Everybody's making movies. Because we need to you know, record our history. And from it, other people can learn something new and fresh from it. So donuts for everyone. <laughs> And I'm here tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be great. And then I leave to get my honorary doctorate from Maryland University on Saturday. So, uh, Dr. Greer. Not bad, not bad. I'll, I'll be humbled. And I learned how to spell, so. Yeah. Well, everyone, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for taking your time today to, to join us in this, in this joy. Back over there. I'm gifts. Oh my God, namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God, I will wear this. Protection. Yes, protection. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice. Very nice. Look at, look at. Do I need this too? That's Bethina's intro if you want it. Yes. Yeah, this is very nice.